talk about model selection, model specification, model selection. But uh, well, I'm, sure. I'm, in, case, uh, in case you don't know, but, uh, <laughs> my name is David Hogg. I'm faculty here uh, in the center, and I uh, I work on astronomy things. Uh, in particular, I try to make astronomical observations more precise, and that's one of the reasons I've spent a lot of time thinking about the things that are in this class. Um, okay. Here we go. So uh, we're going to talk about deciding between models. So um, I'm going to call it model selection. Philosophy section. Um, so you can always get it from Adrian if you don't get it from me. Uh, uh, but let me say some things that are just of a technical nature. So one of the one of the things we've sort of forgotten about in statistics, which is good, is there used to be a really big difference between Bayesians and frequentists. Uh, in how they approach the statistics problem. Now, uh, there's still speakers have used models like this before. Um, and the idea of a model is that you can write down a probability for the data given your parameters. Um, and that, it, fundamentally, that's what a model is uh, from my perspective and also from the perspective of a lot of inference. Now, not all of the lectures we've had in the series have had a probability of the data given parameters. Uh, and that's because there are some problems we work on in, in astronomy in particular, but I think in all fields, where we actually don't really know how to efficiently write this down. So a good example is the correlation function. When we do correlation functions of galaxies, we usually use estimators. And part of the reason is we do know how to write this down for the correlation function, but it would be very expensive to compute. Um, it would have to be a model for the full density field the correlation function on that. So it would be We're looking at that, actually. That's something I've been thinking about for next generation, for SDSS4. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, what do I want to say about this? So the first, so several things about a model. One is, it ha it, in order for you to obey the sort of theorems of statistics, so on the frequentist side, what are the minimum variance unbiased estimators? And on the Bayesian side, project propagating the information from the data into your parameters, uh, you need to be able to write down a probability for your data given parameters. And I'm going to assume that you have that, and that's what is a model. There's a couple of additional notes you should make about this thing, which is one is it is basically a noise model. It's basically a noise model. Why is it really a noise model? Because usually your physical theory predicts the mean behavior of your data, and then the departure of your data from the mean is because of noise. Like you think the data were drawn from a straight line, but they're all scattered around because there was noise. And this likelihood here, this is what's called the likelihood in previous uh, uh, seminars, this likelihood explain, explains how the, the data can be departed from the mean. So it's basically a noise model. And the key idea in modeling is to model your noise. And that's what a lot of this seminar series has been about. In fact, in some sense, it's what all of it has been about. OK, and the other thing I want to say is, in addition, you might have priors. So you might have prior beliefs about these parameters, in addition to this likelihood. If you have those prior beliefs, they're incredibly useful. And this is why Bayesians beat frequentists in the long run, because they can use more information. They can use their prior beliefs when they're doing a data analysis problem, so that's why they get better performance. And that's not an uh, aggressive statement. That's proof, there's proofs that uh, Bayesians have more capability. Of course, they have more capability. They make more assumptions. Or they put more inputs in. Uh, now, the one thing that's very interesting is that I actually believe that for your nuisance parameters, you do have to have priors, and for the parameters you care about, you don't have to have priors. That's a long story, which I'm not going to talk about here. That's part of the philosophy side. Um, uh, so it's sort of the opposite of what many people would think. The part you don't care about is the part you should believe more, you should have more beliefs about, because that's the part you're going to have to actually deal with. Um, but anyway, uh, just for a little bit of terminology, I'm going to call the data D and the parameters theta. And so the, and the prior would be P of theta. And I'm kind of dropping some things. So this is P of D given theta. 
And I'm kind of dropping some things here because, of course, there's, it's never the case that the probability of the data is conditioned just on the parameters. It's also conditioned on something, a lot of other things, like your, the whole model itself. Remember, we're about to choose among models. So usually this is also conditioned on some additional uh, beliefs or hypotheses. Like, you know, one person says, oh, this data is, should be fit by a sine wave. And other people say this data should be fit by a polynomial. The statement sine wave or polynomial goes in here, and the coefficients of that goes in here. See what I have in mind? So then the priors also goes like this. And of course, if you're a Bayesian, every probability distribution is conditional like this. There's always something on the other side of a bar. Um, so in fact, they wouldn't stop there. There's also about things you believe about the world. Okay, good. Um, I'm not supposed to talk about philosophy. Yes. Is this a prior on the certain hypothesis, or the prior then on the uh, this is the priors on the parameters given the, the given the hypothesis. You might additionally have a prior, a prior on the hypothesis. That's going to come back to where when we actually make a decision between models. So what's the difference between H and priors? H contains all the information that specifies your priors by assumption here. The way I've written it, yeah. this prior depends on H. Okay. okay. So so. You, because what I'm saying is that the priors are part of your model. So some people like to think, well, we both fit the same model, but he used different priors. That's not, a, that's not true. They're different models. So this is the statement of what the model is, what your noise model is, and what all your priors are. H is everything uh, if you're amazing. Oh my god. There was a huge argument on the web the last few days about what the conditional is on one of the stats blogs where hundreds of comments and it went on and on. It's very detailed what, what goes on here, but from our perspective, think of this as containing everything you think about the problem. Like that there's a satellite at L2 and it's got bolometers on it. Like shit like that goes in there too. Okay, good. Uh, good. I don't to um, now, uh, now the next, so the next thing is you might have multiple models. And if you have multiple models, you would have P of data given theta A H A. Let me use a capital A because it's a little easier to see. That's model A. And then you could also have P probability of data given parameters B and H B. And in general, these assumptions might be very, very different. And the parameters will also therefore be very, very different. Okay, and you might have, and these might both be pretty reasonable models. In fact, that's quite common in astrophysics, uh, that there are perfectly reasonable competing models. It's also in particle physics right now, you know, people think about supersymmetry models with small numbers of parameters, and there's a lot of different parameter spaces that are equally plausible right now. But they look very different in terms of how you compute your legacy. Okay, now, here's the key, the key point the key point is inference, statistics, whether you're Bayesian or frequentist, everything in this class only tells you about probabilities. All you can do with inference is assign probabilities. Either probabilities to the data given the model, or probabilities to the model given the data, if you're Bayesian. But you can only assign probabilities. Inference cannot tell you how to decide. See what I'm saying? It doesn't tell you what to do. It only tells you what numbers to put on the models. Okay, so, um, So a lot of people, so there's a big, there's a big, um, uh, there's a big literature, I'm going to change my order slightly in response to this question. There's a big literature on computing the probability of the model. Um, because a lot of people think, well, the only principled thing to do here is to choose the model that is higher probability. 
So first of all, that is completely wrong. And second of all, that's not the most principled thing to do. It's not principled at all, and it's not the most principled thing. Uh, it's wrong in every sense. So what's the probability of the model? Well, there's, if you're a frequent, well, no, actually, the only Bayesians can write this down, actually. Um, you can write down something which is the probability of the data given HA. You could write this down. That would be the probability, the, this would be the marginalized likelihood, the likelihood of the data given this hypothesis. How did I get that? I had to get rid of the parameters. Remember, I used to have parameters here. So I have to do an integral, which is P of the data given theta A, theta A, H A, P of theta A given H A, D theta A. I can integrate them out. You notice how, so this, I can actually write down a marginalized likelihood for the model. So this is the overall quality of the model. Right? You see how that even a frequentist in principle could be happy with this. The only reason a frequentist wouldn't be happy with this is that internally I had to use the prior. I had to use the prior. You cannot do this integral without the prior. Okay, this needs to be there. But it's even on the left hand side, right? Because the prior is in HA. Yeah, yeah, it, because the prior is part of the model in this context, exactly. So um, this needs to be here, though, for very, for like math reasons. Sure. I mean, this it would be would be dimensionally incorrect if that wasn't there. Um, by the way, if you want more polemics about what kind of expressions you can write down, I have something on the web called probability calculus for inference. Uh, and if you look that up, I write carefully down all the rules about what you're allowed to do. Um, so this is something that you might write down. And of course, you can do the same thing for the other model. And then, of course, if you have probabilities, if you have prior probabilities for the models, you can take these two things and you can even transform them to probability of HA given the data and probability of HB given the data. So you can even, if you have priors on the hypotheses, you can transform these to these. And so you might think, sweet, I have probabilities for the two models, I'll just choose the most probable. But of course, that's not allowed. If you're a Bayesian, what do you do with these two probabilities? Take a ratio. You can take a ratio if you want. Uh, but what you do is you use these as amplitudes with which to mix the models. Because if you're a Bayesian, everything is probabilistic, right? You're just carrying forward probabilities. And so if this is 99% and this is 1%, then what you do is you then multiply this model by 99% and this model by 1% and you co-add them. So, for example, the Higgs would have no spin or spin 1 and then just take Say, yeah, say you have a no-spin model for the Higgs and a spin-one model for the Higgs, zero spin and one spin, and one comes out to be 99% and one becomes 1%. Then if you're predicting data for the next experiment, or if you want to ask what's your best fit model, it would be the mixture of those two models. It would not be one model or the other. It would be the mixture of them. So that's why, that's why inference doesn't tell you how to decide. It tells you how to mix. So can you yeah. make um, a distinction between model in this case and, uh, I guess, some overall theory? Because there can be two completely different ways. That's right. Two but them. even if they're completely different ways, one is MOND and one is Lambda CDM, when you're predicting, a Bayesian would say that when you're predicting the next set of data, you should mix the predictions of MOND and Lambda CDM in the 99 to 1 ratio. Oh, because. 1% of the time, your data is going to be consistent with MOND. It, 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 like no, it's because you still have some plausibility. It's because MOND has retained some plausibility. And so if you're making a prediction, you shouldn't cut it off arbitrarily. You have to propagate forward that uncertainty. Okay. After all, say the next experiment was very strongly in favor of MOND, but because it had gone down to 1% in the previous experiment, you'd thrown it away. Well, then you would fail to make the discovery at the next experiment that, in fact, it's MOND and this Lambda CDM stuff is all bullshit. So the models do not describe, they just allow you to predict. They think about it in terms of like something that's Exactly. Good. That's, good. that's where we're going to come to. So, right. So in, for a Bayesian, or for a frequentist, but for anybody, the models are descriptions of the data. And by the way, 
people in this room, a lot of you think about, well, but which model is right? In fact, that was kind of the underlying idea behind your thing. Well, they're totally qualitatively different. They can't both be right. But of course, neither model is right. If you actually wanted to write down the probability for this model, what would you get? Zero. And this model? Zero. Why? Because inside here, there's amazing simplifications. These are extremely approximate descriptions of reality. The probability that this is the correct description of reality is zero. Like, the correct description of reality involves the position and velocity of every molecule in this room. Oh, and all the other ones out there, too. And that's a lot of parameters. Your model doesn't have all those parameters, therefore your model is wrong. So, wait, 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 wait. So right? how do you ever come, how do you ever, like, throw a law or a theory or, like... So that is for a separate lecture. Ah, <laughs> oh, no, I haven't answered that. The CFE. Yeah, I'm pretty close to, to being a physically exact model. That's right. I mean, you don't, you don't need to have a model for every photon. You're saying that you're able to do a marginalization there, but in fact, the model for the CMB does a very bad job of describing the CMB because there's all these foregrounds which aren't explained by it, and there's in fact discrepancy else. <laughs> exactly. If you assume they don't exist, it's great. That's my whole point: is that the model in detail has to be wrong. But to rephrase, also lambda CDM is going to be an approximation, right? There's going to be some particle properties for the dark sector. Right now, lambda CDM is the assumption that there's no particle properties in the dark state. So it's got to be wrong at some level. It's just that we don't, the data aren't good enough to see that it's wrong. But it must be wrong. But about the speed of the peaks. Say again. About the speed of the peaks. Mm -hmm. I mean, you cannot really mix the probabilities of every spin zero. And it's a, see, you guys are all such realists. One of the problems with, this, with physicists is they tend to believe that there's a reality out there that's not able to go off. It's so quaint. But, but all your model does when you say that the Higgs has spin zero or spin one is make predictions for new data. If you think of it in that form, as a statistician, your model only makes predictions. From a statistics point of view, it makes predictions. And it's better that you make a better prediction. In fact, there's theorems about this. You'd make a better prediction by predicting 90% 0 and 1% 1 than just saying it's, it's 0. That's the Cox theorems. If you want to look them up, if you want, if, in terms of making predictions, there are these Cox theorems, which are beautifully described in the book by James, uh, in the first chapter of the book by James, that prove that if you do anything other than mix these models, your predictions will be worse. So for instance, if, you, if two people are betting on the outcome of the next experiment, the one who just cuts off and takes the best model to make their prediction for the next experiment, the one who mixes them, the one who mixes them will win the bet in the long run. So but in practice, yeah. you have to chop off your model somewhere. Right? So this is A and B, but Good. you're going to have HC, HD, and then you have to, at some point yeah. you have to get to the end of the No, no, the tag end. team is correct here. At some point, you have to make a decision. <clears throat> Why do you have to make a decision? Not because you want to make predictions. You don't have to make a decision to make predictions, but you do have to make a decision because you want to write something in the abstract of your paper. Because so science is a descriptive activity, and we do want to say the Higgs has zero spin. Actually, is it Higgs zero or one? What is it? Zero. Um, uh, OK, good. Uh, uh, good. So, but this gets back to something very important. So what you want to do is you want to write down the answer in your abstract. What's the point of the papers that you write? Well, it depends a little bit on your age. <laughs> but if you're young, one of the points of your papers is to get you a job and get you citations and improve your ability to continue in other collaborations and etc. So, this sounds like a joke, but this is not a joke. Imagine that these two were coming out very similar. Say this was 55% and this was 45%. And it, Say again. The abstract is weak constraint. Right, you could say that. Okay, good. Let's take it up a little bit so that you would probably want to say something. Let's say it's 85% and 15%. So you could write, this is the right model. But what if this is a model that, if true, would win you the Nobel Prize? You cannot rule out. Then you, see, you see how, but it, absolutely, you see how you would change what you write in the abstract depending on your utility. 
So another way to say it is imagine you had some observations. And if you're a cosmologist, if you're not a cosmologist, you might not get this, but if you're a cosmologist, you had some observations. This was Mond. Your observation said Mond 85% and Lambda CDM 15%. Well, if you're a graduate student, I strongly recommend that you don't say that it's Mond and not Lambda CDM. You want to say something measured about it. So what you specifically write or what you choose to do. But so there's one more situation which comes up a lot in my work is what if it comes out like this, but this model can be computed in a microsecond, and this takes two years of CPU time on the big NASA clusters. Right? Then you might say, you might say, okay, this model is better, but we can compute this model, so we are going to continue using this model so that we can function. See how that you might choose the less probable model because it makes you more money. But all of this discussion does not convince me that taking the ratio of those two numbers is that what was it? Unethical or No, no, I just said it's not principle. It's not principle. It's not principle. It's not principle. Yeah, so I mean just this discussion of eighty five versus fifteen, you know, if you took the ratio of those two numbers, you would have the ratio. For sure. Absolutely. And you should write that in your paper. But like, you know, I I myself and I don't think pretty much any of your constrain these models for the purpose of predicting future data, but I'd rather to constrain parameters or something like that. What, what if you happen to be analyzing the last experiment of a given line of research? Uh -huh, yeah. There's never going to yeah. be another experiment ever. Good. Then your yeah, utility, that plays exactly into my example. That shows you that your utility is different in different situations. So for instance, one good example for this is solar system. So when people are integrating the solar system, the solar system is definitely general relativistic. I mean, it's very clear. You can see it at thousands of sigma in the data, a general relativistic correct model. When people integrate the solar system, what do they use? Newtonian mechanics. It's not because they believe that Newtonian mechanics is more probable. They think that Newtonian mechanics is a pretty good description and very easy to calculate. So it depends on your utility. If you were asking the question, is general relativity correct, you might use the ratio of these probabilities. But in many cases, we are not asking that question in our papers. In many times when we're doing a model selection, we're choosing how to write our code, what projects to work on, what effects to look. Another thing you could say is, well, if this is true, there should be such and such a correlation. If this is true, something else would be true. Should you just not look for this correlation because it's 15%? No, obviously you should go look for the correlation predicted here. You shouldn't throw this model away, especially if that correlation would be very productive and lead to more research. But I'm getting confused because you haven't written down that distinction, right? What you've written down is the probability that some model represents reality given the data. But what you were talking about now is the probability that some model is a good descriptor of data. You know what I mean? So like uh, Newtonian gravity is a good descriptor of yep of planetary orbits, yeah. right? Yeah. But that's not the same thing as that Newtonian gravity is true. The, prob the probability of Newtonian gravity being true. Right. Exactly. So you haven't written that down yet. Well, right, because I jumped that step. I just, right, one, the, what happens is, say, you're, if you're integrating the outer planets, GR and Newtonian are almost identical in their likelihood. Right. But they're very different in their, post in their posterior because we right. think the general relativity is correct and Newtonian is an approximation. Um, right, so, but there's a, yet another distinction I'm making, which is that in addition to the fact that there's, they have different prior probabilities, they also have different utilities. And those utilities are very subjective, in the sense that people integrating the solar system care very differently from a string theorist who's trying to understand the, the solar system. Right. So there are, there are things that those two models predict very similarly. They give very similar predictions for some things, yeah. very different predictions for other things. Exactly. So long as you're looking at the things that they give similar predictions exactly. for, you're fine. It, or it's not just look at, but care about. Care about yeah. Now, but Tinker is absolutely right that if you don't care that much about these, the the if you don't have much utility stake, you really are just trying to ask, you know, is there a fourth species of neutrino? You don't care if there's three or four, even though it'd be much more interesting to find the four. Yeah. Um, but even say you are so principled you don't care, then one thing you can do is you can just ratio those, and then you can just put the ratio in your abstract. That is a perfectly acceptable thing to do. Now, there is one other problem with doing this calculation, is that it is unbelievably hard to do this calculation. There are very few times in the astrophysics literature this calculation has ever been done correctly in a non-trivial model. It's almost impossible to do it. Like because people are not skilled or because it's difficult to do? It's, it's genuinely difficult to okay. do. It's close to NP hard to do this calculation. The reason is that in general, your, 
you what you have to do is you have to integrate you have to integrate all the interesting the prior over all the interesting parts of your livelihood. And in general, you don't know the interest, you can't find all the interesting parts of your livelihood. It's very hard. Uh, so there's all this crazy machinery for doing this called nested sampling and slice sampling and various things that are designed to help you calculate this. If you don't need to do this, don't do this. It's almost impossible. So which part is hard? The, the, the integral over here or is very to get the It's the integral. It's the integral, over here. the integral is just brutal. Because in general, this parameter space is large. Like lambda CDM, you've got 13 parameters there. And then you have to put in the CMB, they can do it because their likelihood is a perfect Gaussian. But if your likelihood is in a Gaussian and you're in a 13 dimensional space, it's pretty hard. And that's nothing. I mean, the spaces we work in now are usually thousands of dimensions. And then it's really impossible to do this. Now, the thing that a Tinker really had in mind, I think, was ratioing these things, taking the ratio of the likelihoods at the maximum likelihood. And that is a pretty reasonable thing to do. That's what I'm going to now talk about. I still uh, am going to bash it. Yes? Yeah. It would seem to me that if you changed your prior and you got drastically different results, then you don't have Good, so another big issue here is that this does depend extremely sensitively on your prior. So this, I, yeah, and I don't like this for that, that's yet another reason not to use this. It depends strongly on your prior and not at all on your utility. See that, how that's sort of screwed up? Because you usually understand your utility a lot better than you understand your priors. You don't really know how many stars are going to have planets that are 1.1 Jupiter masses. But you really know that if you find an Earth-like planet in a habitable zone, you are on. You see what I'm saying? So you know much more about your utilities than your priors. You do this incredibly hard integral over a prior you don't even believe, and then you still haven't got to what, you're, what you actually want. But, he, but in addition, as you say, this is very sensitive to your priors. So basically, I do not advise doing this <coughs> integral. This integral, is, this integral is hard, bad, dangerous. And I say dangerous because you can tune your priors and tune your outcome of that. Really, this only works if you really do have a prior that actually represents your prior beliefs. Like literally actually represents them. Like you've taken the sum of all your prior experiments, figured out the posterior from all prior experiments, and you're using that as your prior. Then it makes sense to use it. Okay. Good. Uh, good. So now let's let's step back and talk about what people actually do. So the standard thing to do, so let's let's do a very simple example. Chi-squared theory, which is how we began, how we began this uh, seminar series. So in chi-squared fitting, what you do is you find the what I would say the argmax over theta a of chi-squared in model a. So the argmax is the value of the parameters that maximizes chi-squared. And that is that relates to the max. That gives you also the max of chi squared. Okay. Oh, sorry, you're right. So I always get confused because of my. Actually, in my papers, I insist on calling it optimization, not minimization or maximization. Only optimization, so that I don't have to remember. Um, so you get the min. So you get the best parameters in model A, and you get the minimum chi squared in, in model A, and then you do the same thing in model B. And a standard thing you might do is you might just difference those chi-squares. Okay, so one thing you could do is you could just say, well, is chi-squared A minus chi-squared B greater than zero, say. Okay, and if it's greater than zero, then it's a more likely model at best fit. Sorry. It's a more likely model at best fit. Okay. Now, there's two problems with that. One problem is um, that my, one problem is that general cluster of problems, which I'm not going to return to until the end. But another problem is these two models might be extremely different. So, for instance, this model might have a huge amount of freedom, and this model might have very little freedom. So, for instance, if I think I'm actually going to show you some data. In fact, why don't I just show you the data? 
Good. So if I show you, if I put up this flush of this piece of data, um, yeah, why don't I use one of my examples right now? Uh, there's a piece of, there's some data, and you can imagine trying to fit these data with some kind of model. So this is very like, this is fake data, arbitrary stuff. But, but one kind of model you could try to fit this data with would be a constant. Okay, and that, the, this constant has only one free parameter, which is where you put this constant. And that is the way that least squares best fit constant. And then people might say, well, another possible model, a qualitatively different model, would be to fit it with a straight line. That works a lot better. Obviously, chi-squared got better when I made that move. But the model also got more complicated. I had to represent it with two parameters instead of one parameter. You see how I went to a more complex model, a less predictive model? But of course, I got better chi-squared. But why stop there? Here's the cubic. Check out how awesome cubic is. <laughs> That's the best fit cubic. But it's slightly better. So you see how if you just decided on chi, on, on chi squared alone, you would go, sweet! It's a cubic. Actually, that's a quadratic. Yeah, that's a quadratic. K is three. That's K is the number of degrees of freedom. Sorry, that's a quadratic. Why is so, a more complicated one less predictive? Just, just because, I don't know, one of you two asked that. Uh, just because, <laughs> I can tell the game from this region. I can tell it had that kind of CUNY sound. Um, uh, Careful. Careful. Uh, Careful. 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 Uh, the, well, I'll come back to that, but, okay. but fundamentally the reason is that you can fit a wider range of data sets with a quadratic than with a linear. So if I had data that was you know, doing this, I could fit it with a quadratic, but I wouldn't be able to fit it with a linear function. So a model has more freedom or is less predictive if it can fit more data. It's less predictive in the sense that more, it can predict more data, but that makes it less predictive because it, up front you don't know what the data are going to look like. And using reduced chi squared is always wrong, but I'll show you what the right thing to do. Another way to say it is the quadratics are combined to another way to that's, yeah. that's another one. Good. Yes. Good, good, good. Very good rephrase from Gabe. Quadratics can fit lines, but not the other way around. The leading coefficient is zero. So a model has more freedom if it can fit more situations. Super set. Good. And then we can go to. Uh, Cubic, that improved a lot, but it is also a much more uh, complex model. And as I keep going up, the models get better and better in terms of chi-squared. They always do because there's more freedom, but they start to get really unbelievable. Like that model's starting to look really unbelievable. You can see that's probably not the right model, but well, look at damn, it does a good job of explaining the data. Define unbelievable, though, because if you uh, really believed that that's what the You might believe that 12th order polynomials explain data of this type. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like, well, it's not it's like, like a or anchor or something. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you might, in fact, you might say, oh, I should really be fitting this with sinusoids. Right, so this exactly. is good. Great, right, but that would be, exactly that's exactly what we're talking about. Right, good. So in fact, what people do, of course, is not this. It's related to the, the reduced chi-squared, but the reduced, basically, you ne there's never a situation in which you want to compute the reduced chi-squared. You never want to divide chi-squared by anything. That's not really an allowed operation. One way you get to think about that is chi-squared is the thing that comes in the exponential of a likelihood function. So dividing it is like taking your likelihood to some weird power, which is a strange thing. But subtracting things from chi squared makes sense. So what in fact people do is they do chi squared a minus some constant times the number of parameters in the a model. And then they compare that to chi squared b minus some, or sorry, plus, plus, I'm still having my sign issues, some uh, the number of parameters in B. So you see what, what happens is you are, you penalize the chi-square. Same, same constant. Same constant, exactly. This is some constant. Sometimes that constant is two. Sometimes that is constant, constant is the natural log of the number of data points. How's it choose? By heuristics. There's a set of heuristics called BIC. 
And there's this head of heuristics called AIC, and then there's a whole bunch of other ICs. What's the IC? Uh, information criteria. It's about how much you penalize the fact that you have information in your model. That's why it's an information criteria. How good are the underlying uh, assumptions of those? Very bad. So I'm going to say that you shouldn't use these. You should not use this approach. But this is similar to the number of degrees of freedom approach. But having said that you should not use it, I often do. And why do I use it? Because of my utility. Because often I have to make a decision in the middle of a program. The program needs to run in a few milliseconds. And during that few milliseconds, we have to decide, are we going to use a third order polynomial or a fourth order? And we just make the decision on the basis of BIC, and we keep rolling. Because doing anything else that I'm going to show you would have to stop and go, oh, model selection time, uh, and then run all these model cross-validation operations, and then come back and keep going. And we're not willing to pay that price. So we do use these, but we use them in places where we need efficiency. So if you had two models and your only two choices were class work, you agree for you to do this, you recommend you always use this? Always use this. Kaiser Bird Degree of Freedom is not justified in any situation. I've never heard this. Whereas this yeah, is. I've never heard of this. It's <laughs> funny because people. Kaiser Bird Degree of Freedom. So, Andy Gould's paper, which, the crazy paper, which you may or may not have seen, talks about Kaiser the difference between precision and accuracy. The, deciding between models, oddly, is a precision decision, it's not an accuracy decision. You're saying which model is uh, more precise on the data, more predictive of the data. Or it's, another way to say it is it's about, you can, you can actually have these models be the same model with different parameter sets, right? And so you can actually do this kind of operation with the same model with different parameter sets, and then it just becomes delta chi-squared, and of course you try to find the minimum chi-squared set of parameters. Right? You could just fix them, for, anyway. There's, so this is the only thing, the only thing you ever do is difference chi-squared. So if you're doing anything other than difference in chi-squared, you're making mistakes. So you see how this is a difference of chi-squareds? It's a difference of chi-squareds, but it's penalized by a difference in model freedom. Is that the only way to characterize model freedom is the number of parameters? Ah, no, in fact, it's the, it's the wrongest. That's what I'm saying, right? <laughs> right, I, I'll talk a little bit about that, but it's going to get beyond the scope of this. But, it, but you're saying that it works. It works in cases like this. Well, actually, let's look. I took this to all orders. And there's chi-squared. See how chi-squared just gets better and better as we go? One thing you'll notice is in going from a linear fit to a quadratic, chi-squared didn't improve very much. Remember, we saw that it didn't improve very much. And then it improved a lot to the, quartic, I mean, to the cubic. And then there was a space where it didn't do very well. And then as it started to be able to put in the wiggles, it started to get better again. So you can see how there's some, just looking at this curve, you learn a lot about the model and the data. But now if we do this, uh, this is AIC. AIC is chi squared plus two times the number of parameters. That's the ICACI information criterion. Actually, ICACI wrote the paper and he called it A information criterion. Criteria, okay. Rude. Uh, uh, but anyway, in the, in the AIC, you see how models, uh, the, the linear fit and the, and, the, and the cubic are preferred. These later models had an excellent chi-squared, but they're not preferred because they have so many degrees of freedom. So it works pretty well in this case, and it does accord with your intuition if you look back. So you would say, well, you would say that isn't much of a change. But you'd say, that might be enough of a change to justify. See? But then as you go up, you're like, oh, that's looking a little crazy. And so in fact, it accords with your intuition in this case. And the reason, one of the reasons it accords with your intuition in this case is this is an example in which the assumptions of AIC are perfectly met. The assumptions of AIC are that there, that there is uh, Gaussian errors, linear model components, and uh, and that the and the and some things about the dynamic range of the components. But anyway, the the uh, the the conditions of AIC are kind of met. And how many two of you? Yeah, yeah. Very, the yeah, paper is so yeah. hard to understand. I've read it a million times. I still don't understand it. Uh, and BIC, they get the log of the number of data points, which is also very hard to understand. When you say the conditions are met, you mean that under those assumptions that it's known that this correctly captures in some mathematical For some to... utility, for a particular choice of utility, it chooses the best model. 
a choice of utility that even ICACI does not explain very precisely. It has something to do with predicting left out data. But I don't know. I don't really understand. Statistics is hard, people. Do you have good reference for weeding? Yeah, if you wanted to Google Those two things. There are web pages. On. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the Wikipedia pages on them are useless. Uh, Exactly. I've actually been writing about <laughs> I have to say, one of the things I, this is actually a statement of a, a short note I'm writing for the archive eventually. And I guess I should then also translate it to mark down for Wikipedia. Um, so zero is plotted, but it's off the plot. Oh, yeah, it's so bad. It's such a bad fit, it didn't even make it on the plot. I don't know what my next view graph is. Oh, the BIC. So BIC is just uses lon the number of data points instead of two. Huh. That doesn't have to as well. Uh, well, it does well. What's, what's not well it's, about this? It makes a decision. What oh, more do you want? No. <laughs> All this criterion is supposed to do is make a decision for you. Well, yeah. it does. Looks like it makes stand down. It looks like it makes a bad <laughs> Oh, you like four better than, you like, like four three. better than? Three, right? Because that's one. That's just a No, that's straight a straight line. line. Yeah. Well, so AIC tells you that one is better than three. AIC tells me. Okay, yeah. yeah so I'm trying to get one. Okay, so AIC likes this. That's right. Well, no, no, no. BIC no, no. likes this, yeah. and AIC likes this, but only marginally. Right? There's two, and there's four. I think most people in this room would say it's either two or four. Um, and notice it's pretty nice. One of them says it's, well, what was the input? See, AIC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, 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 what you're saying, yeah. yeah. God does not tell you what the input model is. <laughs> Although you seem to think so when it comes to the CMB. <laughs> um, okay, good. So uh, cross-validation. So we're about to talk about what cross-validation is. My goodness, time flies. Um, well, we could postpone to a subsequent meeting. Yeah, we have, we have some days. We do have some empty days. Okay, good. I'm glad it's like 15 minutes. Oh, I was thinking we started at 9. I'm like, wow, I, my mental clock is fucked. But no, we're good. Okay, good. It's not 15 minutes. Good. So I'm trying to do cross validation. Okay, so cross validation um, says 4. And we're about to talk about what this is. Yeah. Can we go back to you? So you have only errors on the y axis. That's also like the. That's right, that's right. So that's, one, one, one assumption that's an assumption that in the model. Right. They, they actually, there's a lot of assumptions in these models. So in this model, there's a lot of assumptions. One of the assumptions is that there's only errors in this direction. Another assumption is the errors are known. Another assumption is they're known to have these values. Another assumption is the data really are at these locations in the x direction, and there's no uncertainty in that. Another assumption is they're generated by uh, polynomial, and another assumption is that the uncertainties are Gaussian. Oh, this one works for polynomial model? No, the AIC and BIC are, are demonstrated for linear models. For nonlinear models, they tend to work fairly well, but they're not, they certainly don't have any proofs. They're only proofs for linear models, and in fact, in BIC, for linear models with uh, Gaussian. Linear the parameters. Linear in the parameters, Gaussian priors. Yeah. But if the errors are unknown, is there, is there any point in doing any of this? Like, going on one <laughs> it's funny that you say that because the vast majority of statistical inferences are done on data where the errors are unknown. By the way, are you in astronomy, the errors are always unknown. Every astronomer thinks they know their errors, but they do not know their errors. They put in an error model with parameters that they usually set according to a manual. That manual is not generated through probabilistic inference, so that manual is wrong. Is that worse than writing zero? Well, if your errors are not zero, then writing down zero is a bad idea. A better thing to do, even for astronomers, is to put in all the errors as model parameters. And sometimes you know relative errors. Sometimes, or sometimes you know some contributions but not others, right. and sometimes the contributions are linked in certain ways. If you have a generative model for your errors, you should put in the parameters of that and infer them at the same time. We do do that in many instances, but I'm not going to do that now. If I was talking about errors, I would talk about that. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, this is a, there's a lot to say about these examples in general. Um, okay, good. Let me talk about what cross-validation is and tell you why I think it's a good idea, and then I'll finish by just flashing a few more examples. Uh, let's see, I think I have a blank page. Um, so cross-validation is going to say four. Oh, God did reveal. <laughs> Uh, and then we're going to go through the cross-validation thing here. Okay, so I guess I just have to pull back to the lines. Okay, good. Um, so what's cross-validation? So the thing that I advocate for, if, if you really understand your priors and your utility, and you have a fuck a lot of computers, do this. If you, um, if you need to make a decision really fast, like it's inside code and you have to jet, do this. And the decision between these is a trivial decision. You just have to experimentally decide what works better for you. These differences are differences in utility. They're, they're making a choice. So the difference is in utility. Therefore, you have to just test them and see which one is more in line with your utility. So you have to just try it. If, however, you're in, in the usual place that most of our, us are, that you have a complicated model, you have some free parameters in it, you don't know how to set it, or you have two models, and they're both pretty good, like you can either treat the errors as Gaussian or you can treat them as Poisson, or you have some difference like that and you don't know how to decide, then my recommendation is to use cross-validation. So the way cross-validation works is this. The way cross-validation is, it works is this. The data, the data are a list of data points in what I'm going to assume. Okay, so there's n, oops, that was n plus 1. So the, there's n data points, um, and uh, like there was in my example here. And then as just parallel exactly to Tindra when he was talking about uh, not bootstrap, but jackknife. When he's talking about jackknife, we're going to make subsamples. We're going to make leave one out subsamples. D, and I'm going to call them, I guess I could call, there's many different notations. Let's call it D N. And what this is, is D1 D2, dot, 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 dn, dot, 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 dn. And we just cross out the nth point. We take it out. Okay? And then what we do, so we make these leave one out subsamples, d brackets n. And then we use the, what we learn from this sample to predict the left out point, dn. So we use all of dn to predict dn. And then we do that, we loop over all possibilities of n, and the best model wins. So what the we do... The model that best predicts the missing, the missing data point wins. Exactly. So what we do is we optimize, so we take our argument. This is the frequentist version. So it's like, warning, frequentist. By the way, actually I'm seen in the world as being a hardcore Bayesian, but I'm not. I'm extremely pragmatic. We do this when we need to go fast. We don't do this Herbazian thing because it's so insanely crazy. So we are pragmatic. So as a pragmatic statistician, this is the thing you should do. So what you do is you take the argmax, let's say we're in model A, theta A, P of data in N, the leave one out subsample, um, given theta A, H A, and we call this thing theta n a. This is the parameters you get when you've dropped the nth data point. Right? How did you combine uh, dropping the how did you combine dropping the different data points? Like, I'm just about to get there. So now then you produce P uh, actually we can do it in one shot. And now we're going to produce the probability of the nth data point given the theta n a, h a, 
that is now, this is a prediction. You see how this thing is a prediction? We're asking what's the probability. By the way, that's another big thing. Astronomers and physicists think a prediction is telling what the value is. But for a statistician, a prediction is telling what the probability is. Um, so we predict this data point. And then what we do, of course, is we product over all n. And this you could call the, C, the, the uh, cross validation likelihood for model A. See what we did? I'm about to demonstrate it in pictures. Now, why is this a good idea? So you might think, like, this is some made up crazy procedure. Why is it a good idea? The reason it's a good idea is it's t it chooses the model that is the best at predicting new data under the assumption that your data were drawn in some sense. So if your data were drawn in a sensible way, then this tells you how well do I predict the next piece of data. What, and let's talk more generally, why does it work? Say your model is too rigid, it doesn't have enough flexibility. If it doesn't have enough flexibility, then it can't, like say you use this model. Well then it can't capture the fact that the data are doing this, so it's not gonna do a good job of predicting new data. Now imagine the data, the model is too floppy, it's too flexible, it's like 17th order polynomial. Well then the model can go through any of the data points it likes, and when it goes to a new data point, it's gonna like flop into a totally different model to catch that new data point. So a very, a very low order model, a very rigid model, won't predict anything well. And a very floppy model doesn't predict anything at all. So you, you don't predict on one side because your model is too rigid, you don't predict on the other side because it's too floppy. Correct, so, so wait a minute, so does, and how's that come out in practice for the one that overfits with uh, this uh, product? The, like the overfitting model? So if I have data like this, the overfitting model is like going like this, and then you find that you're not, the missing data point is like this, and so, but this is a very flexible model, so it has no trouble coming in and picking it up. Okay, so what does that um, result in in terms of the, the probability of the prediction of the data given the model, the model can over predict? Like, because you're, you're, what you're telling me is that this parameter is going to yeah. be low for yeah. models that are... Yeah, good. Okay, let me give a better example. It's under your criteria. So say this is your data, and say your model is really flexible, so it does this to capture all the data points. Now, uh, if the next data point is here, that's very, very consistent with what you saw in the data that I drew before. But obviously, it's going to have to make a very big change to the model here. It's going to have to do like this. Does it change the model when you take out the... I thought it just so the model, the model was predicting this offset, right? The model was predicting that this data point should be here. In fact, it came here. Right. Now imagine you had a more rigid model. The more rigid model would have done a better job of predicting this data point. Well, we're going to see it in the example but in a second. Yeah. One of these values that you calculate, it doesn't find a new model for that missing data point. Yeah, it just exactly. says that it just tells exactly. you how bad It just tells you how bad that model and is so given the So others. we're going to loop over this? Are we looping yeah. over different models? Are we looping over ah. different things? We, here we, we loop over every left out data point and we put no, no. it together. Right. But this only gives us one. Exactly. Thing. And then we do the same thing for the B model. Right. Okay. Right. And the ratio right. of those probabilities is going to be. Really, actually, the ratio of those probabilities is very related, actually, to the ratio of these problems. So, but, and the, but the parameters themselves, theta a, yeah, theta. they will be different in every case. Correct. So, are you? How are you getting theta a? This is totally separate from the question of getting theta a. Okay, I'm assuming you way. have a likelihood optimizer here, okay. yes. and then at the end of the day, you decide, okay, model a is better than model b. Then you go back into your science with model a, forgetting about model b forever, and thus losing you the opportunity of getting the Nobel Prize. Just to clarify, previous example. <laughs> polynomial fit varying degree. Yeah. Uh, you're saying here, cross validation, there's no AIC, there's no BIC, this will automatically penalize Just the higher Just automatically penalizes the more flexible models. So then why does that see it Is this significantly more expensive to... Well, you have to calculate your model okay, every time. The, the, right, this is more expensive because you have to do this optimization every time. See. But it is much less assumption laden. There's so many assumptions in here that I could give a whole seminar about Why that. Why is this a that it's a new one? Ah, uh, good. That is the exact same issue as the jackknife. You can chop up your data in other ways. You can leave two out, you can leave patches of the sky out, you can do, you, yeah. It has all the same properties as jackknife. In fact, you will recall that when he was talking about jackknife, I said, Jeremy, can you write leave one out on the board? Because I wanted it to reappear. 
And it really is the same as Jackknife. It's just that it's running Jackknife in the predictive mode as well, opposed to the experimental yeah, don't, don't forget that Jackknife one meant a chunk of data. It's larger. Right, whereas here. Yeah, yeah. But here you could do the same thing. You see how this is well, another reason this is a very uh, clean um, Yeah, I mean, you do at least one out, I assume, if you have correlated data. Exactly. If you have correlated data, you might want to leave chunks of data out. Exactly. It's a, it's like, there's an art to this, of course, like everything. Can I leave D1 and D7 just because I like it? Uh, one, one thing that's known is that choosing cleverly is often worse than choosing dumbly. You often make mistakes choosing cleverly. Because in a way you're putting it. So, right. So, in general, you want to um, choose uh, dumbly. dumbly. But within the constraint. Okay, so let's look at cross validation. Oh, I can't believe I put truth in there. I'm so sad. I wanted to leave it ambiguous about the truth. Okay, good. So, those are the cross validation trials. Though there, what we've done is I've dropped each data point successively, and those are the models you get. So this model here, which data point do you think I dropped to get this model? Different models. Those are different models. Those are different things. Sorry. These are the different parameters you got by dropping. These are the okay. n. See, I get these theta n a. I get n values of the parameters. Thank you. That was a very good clarifying question. Um, so this model, which data point do you think I dropped when I computed this model? The one point zero. Other top one because this, this is essentially the weighted average. Okay, good. So now, as I go through, now I'm going to show you as I go up. It's, I mean, you can look at this for ages because it's so much fun. And so there's, there's the straight lines. They actually are all very consistent yeah. with one another. So that's looking pretty good. By the way, consistency is not the same as this. What we're really doing. So um, it's fun to figure out which data point was dropped for this. The middle top one. It's also the top one, you see? And now, then we were computing what's the probability of that data point given this model, you see? How this works? So, um, but now, then we can go to three. And again, you can see there's four, five, six. And then the predictions are getting a little bit more noisy as we go up. Predict what's about to happen. So you see? What, what, what data point was dropped for this model? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. was dropped for this? See, and you can see how it's starting to get, it predicts very accurately within the data points it used, and then poorly the data points it didn't use. And you can imagine what happened there. So, 16, 15th protocol, no, no, not a good idea. Um, so there's a cross validation likelihood. It peaks at four, although it's not very unhappy with one. And with, but notice, it really doesn't like this model. It doesn't like two. It doesn't like the quadratic, because the quadratic does not improve the fit very much at the expense of additional parameters. Those additional parameters mean that these cross validation trials are not as predictive as they might be, even though the chi squared for these two models is very similar. So we just say that big that AIC is Yeah, it's very similar. Actually, it comes out very similarly to AIC and BSC. It's just it likes slightly higher complexity, and that is in general. AIC and both did like three though, right? That's right. That's right. So which one did it like the best? You know, I know, but I just can make sure. Oh yeah, I, I can show you that. And I also have the cross validation here. Oh, you need to pass. See, AIC likes one three. BIC likes one, and cross validation likes four. And the truth is four. Nice. Actually, did not tune this example. This was the first draw of the random number generator. Look, it also like notice how like nine comes back. <laughs> and if you look carefully at the diagrams, you can see why nine comes back. Anyway. Um, I have another example here. Good, yeah, I do have time to show you one more example. So, just make sure, so in the last slide, you just had the log of that value for each. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good, good, good. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, it's just the, I just took the log of this product. Because the log of this product, of course, if you multiply the log of this product by 2, the natural log of the product by 2, it's like a chi-square. My minus 2, it's like a chi-square. So you can actually, and in fact, you can describe this, instead of doing a product of the p's, you can do a sum of the chi-squares here, you see? So you can, if you, like, if you don't like all this multiplying things, and you shouldn't if you write computer programs, 
you should always be working the log or in chi-square. You can work one or the other. Um, often you don't have Gaussian noise, and then it's more complicated as a question. Um, so I just want to show you another example just to get at this idea. So there's this general question of like, what is the model freedom? Gabe asked that question. And I have a lot of examples. People think of the model freedom as being the number of parameters. What I wrote here is the number of parameters. This is the number of parameters. But that isn't really the model freedom. I can give you an example of a model that has only three parameters, but can fit any set of data you can write down ever, no matter what. Which, if anybody wants to hear about that, they can ask me. Three parameters can fit any set of data ever. Yeah, exactly, right. So the number of parameters doesn't directly come to the but so, and the other thing is, there's this sort of idea that there's the number, this, this BIC depends on the number of data, there's like a number of data and a number of parameters, people talk about the number of degrees of freedom and, you know, the number of degrees of freedom can't be negative, you can't have more parameters than data, you'll die, things like that. But it's not true. Here I'm now going to fit this, I'm now going to fit the data with a model that has more parameters than there are data, but still has limited freedom. Okay, so same data set, and oh, I forgot this point. Before I do that, <laughs> one of the things that's great about uh, you, one of the things I was just saying to Jeremy is that astronomers never know their errors, even though they think they do. So imagine you just underestimated all your errors by 40%. How you would do that is very challenging. You're more likely to underestimate me by something in quadrature, but anyway. Um, imagine you just underestimated all your error bars by 40%. Well, now everything goes to hell. Well, first of all, chi-square drops really rapidly as you go to higher order. Another thing is, the AIC moves to a higher polynomial order. Remember, it was at 1. BIC also moves to higher polynomial order. Okay? And, but cross-validation stays peaked at the same location. Now, cross-validation, all that happened with cross-validation, you'd have to have uh, photographic memory. But if you have a photographic memory, cross-validation, the underestimation of the errors just stretch yeah, this guy. So the rank ordering remains the same. Rank ordering stays the same. So cross-validation is robust to certain kinds of mistakes in your error model. Because it really is about how you predict the new data, it's not telling you a posteriori things about your existing data. And is this true also true if your errors are not Gaussian? It's not strictly true if they're not Gaussian, but you're just more robust to wrongness by your errors. Nothing is strictly true beyond Gaussian. So if you're not computationally limited, just need to do this. For sure. And even this is not that computationally expensive. In general, if you can split your data into 10 chunks, it only takes 10 times as much computation as your original inference. Unlike this, which takes millions of times the amount of computation of the original oh, so this say you cut your data into ten chunks and you do ten leave one out trials, then this whole operation takes ten times as long as your original inference. Because you have to do it ten times over. Within each sub chunk, it'll still be uh, very good within that sub chunk. Imagine it takes you a day to optimize your likelihood. Yeah. Because optimizing your likelihood is hard. Yeah. Then cross validation tenfold leave one out cross validation would take ten days. Yeah. This would take years. This would take milliseconds. You see? But there must be a way to, okay, there must be a way to optimize the number of such chunks. So you guess. There's a literature on that, like on the bootstrap and uh, jackknife literature. Okay, here we go. So here's a model. So this is a model that has more parameters than data. Um, so this line is a set of very, very small line segments with, I think, something like 60 control points. These are sometimes 60 control points, and it's, it's line segments with 60 control points. So this is a 60 parameter model fit to some 20 data points. So obviously, I must be deeply lying to you. Something's totally wrong, and the whole world is probably like causality is violated, and like people are coming out of black holes, and all sorts of things are happening. The paper will be rejected. <laughs> and of course, your paper will certainly be rejected. But here, why, does, why do I get a smooth fit? I, I use a very large number of parameters. Why do I get a fit at all? Why do I get a smooth fit? It's because I've regularized the fit. I've put in a prior. If you're a Bayesian, it's a prior. If you're frequentist, it's a regularization. Where I asked this to be like a string that's pulled tight. And I've, I, can, I can adjust the tension. And the tension is this epsilon parameter, which is set to e to the, no, 2 to the 12. 
I've set this epsilon parameter to 2 to 12, and the epsilon parameter is saying, how much am I willing to have the, the uh, string bent in response to the data points? So I can now reduce that string tension, and if I reduce the string tension, the model gets, becomes a better and better fit to the data, you see? And of course, then it starts to overfit the data. But you see how, in the previous model, the model complexity was a discrete quantity. It was like, what is the order of our polynomial? But your model complexity can actually be a very flexible thing. It can be a continuous parameter. So this is a knob labeled model complexity, and I can just tune that knob. See? This is called spline fit? This is like a spline fit. This is a, this is a first order spline fit. It's not smooth. You said smooth. It's not smooth. It's smoother than this. Well, it's because it's first order. If I made it, if I drawn that as a cubic spline, it would look all smooth, and then we just got all wiggly here. Oops. But similarly, so this this string tension that I'm using to control the complexity is another kind of parameter where you don't know how to set it. You know you need to have it because if you don't have it, you literally can't optimize a 60 parameter model. You have to have a regularizer in here because there's more parameters than data. By the way, my view is that there's always more parameters than data, and if there aren't, you're making a horrible approximation. But anyway, there are the only way to optimize this model is to put this tension in, but you don't know what level to set it. But of course, once again, you can set the level of this with cross-validation. So cross-validation sets a particular value for this string tension. It's very soft. It says there's a lot of string tensions that are reasonable. But, but, it, uh, uh, but in fact, in very difficult situations like this one, cross-validation can be used to actually do parameter estimation uh, when you have a parameter that controls your complexity. So another case like that is um, exoplanets. If you're fitting exoplanets, if you do have an eccentricity, you have a five-parameter model. If you don't, you have a three-parameter model, I mean, for things like radial velocities. And to how do you decide whether you should allow it to have the freedom of the eccentricity? That, the eccentricity is kind of like a continuous uh, model complexity parameter. Uh, yes? If I see something flat like this, which is yeah. that there are a whole lot of models that are equally good or equally bad, yeah. my brain is thinking like something's wrong. Like if there's no sort of really good answer, should I consider model a different model? It depends on your con That gets completely back to this utility point. I mean, Sometimes you're really the shape, forced. The shape of this is diagnostic in any way. Uh, yeah, it is diagnostic. It's, it, it is diagnostic. It says that you don't have much control on this parameter. On the other hand, it is. It's not necessarily the case that a good model will be well constrained and a bad model will be poorly constrained. That's not necessarily the case. Though I do think it does happen to be the case in this situation that cross validation is more peaked in the polynomial case in this case because I really did generate the data from. What's K here? The same thing from the number of, or that was the number of, what, the degree of quality? Oh, K here is actually the number of control points. I didn't have 60 control points, I had 80 control points. So this is an 80 parameter model. In every case, this is an 80 parameter model. So K is always 80, you see, in all of these. Yeah, yeah, so I can even see that in K of 80 up there. That means there's 80 control points in here that are setting this. Why? Oh, just random. Yeah, I could have chosen thousands, and then I just would have had a different interpretation of that tension parameter. How are you determining the control point? I think they're equally spaced in this case. Yeah. They don't have to be either. Right? No, in fact, if you if you in the, the end, we're going to talk about machine learning techniques. We'll talk about Gaussian process. If we did a Gaussian process, it would only be supported on the actual locations of the data here, and that would be a very flexible model just to support the. Your tension parameter controls local curvature. Of the yeah, it control. Well, it controls local curvature. It penalizes local curvature. If you think of it as a regularization, it penalizes local curvature. If you think of it as a prior, it tries to draw the points from a Gaussian that is uh, flat. Uh, uh, oh yeah. Well, I'm basically done, and I'm past time. The only remaining piece of uh, philosophy I was going to talk about that I won't, so I'll just flash it, is that in fact, when you're deciding, so when I started, I said, you know, you have to make these decisions sometimes. I think as scientists, the main decisions you're making are what to write in the paper, what to put on the title, what to put in the abstract. 
And people don't think of those decisions as statistical decisions. But they are statistical decisions because you have uncertainty in your results and you have to decide what to say about your results. And I think when you transform from your results to what you write about them, you should think about your utility. You should think about what is my audience, what are my goals. You are not constrained purely by probability. If one model is slightly more probable than the other, but the other one's more interesting, spend your time on the interesting one. That is permitted because statistics does not rule in all matters. Statistics just gives you inputs to your decision making. The statistics does not make your decisions for you, and you shouldn't permit it to make decisions for you. So how do you make this utility quantitative so that you're not, because I can, I can see yeah. a utility function that yeah. completely washes out the decisions. Good. So one, one, the big issue and the main reason people don't like thinking in terms of utility um, is that they don't know how to write down their utility. Uh, in, there are some cases where it's very clear and you can write it down. So for instance, in here's one case that I know. In astrometry.net, we people submit an image to astrometry.net and then we locate it on the sky and tell them where the image is located on the sky. Our reputation is based on not being wrong. So we explicitly have a table inside the code which says how many dollars do we reward ourselves if we return a correct answer, and how many time dollars do we penalize ourselves if we return an incorrect answer, and how many dollars do we penalize ourselves if we just say, I don't know, I can't figure it out. And we, so we have that explicitly specified, and we take, we take uh, probabilities of we're right and we're wrong, and we pre-multiply them by these dollar amounts, and we try to make the decision that makes us the most money under that model. So we have an absolutely explicit financial model in there about our utility. And I think that is the best way to go. If you can make a financial model, that's the way to go. So one place that this comes up in astronomy all the time, a terrible instance, was the Dark Energy Task Force. The Dark Energy Task Force said that cosmology missions should be rated on how much area they, they leave behind on the WW prime plane. Okay? That's a great idea. That's a utility. Except that it wasn't specified in dollars. So they weren't able to compare a mission that took it down by a factor of two and cost $10 million with one that took it down by square root of two and cost $2 million. They weren't able to make those kinds of decisions. Um, so it really helps if you can write things down in dollars. Now, in reality, none of us can write anything down in dollars. We have no idea. So I think in many cases, you just don't have a plan. But, it, but when you're making decisions inside a piece of code, as you often are, so a lot of the decisions that you're, you make actually are made by a computer program. Then there really often is. Uh, you've got a branch point, you're like, this will take more RAM, this will take more compute time. And then I think you really should be thinking in terms of those, uh, those costs. You do have real costs. So I don't really have an answer. That's a bullshit answer. I don't have an answer. It's very hard to write down anything quantitative. My real point is that the statistics are only a guide to your decision making. They're the only helpful to your decision making. They do not decide for you. Just side note. So philosophically then, just, it sounds like you're espousing a position that uh, there's no way to get around like our the, 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 the human <laughs> that human sense of like, well, you know, I don't know what the fuck's going on, but once I look at this, if it's right, I'll know it when I see it, I'll recognize it. Right? That's right. My view is that there's no way to get around that fundamental issue. So then Okay, so then in some sense you're also espousing the same the position that there's that the idea that somehow we can use math or whatever, right? Statistics, whatever it happens to be, to circumvent any evolutionarily imposed errors that are in that that's sort right. of emission process, that that is that's right. a self delusion that's not that's true. right. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah for sure. And in fact, the one thing that's often often forgotten about in these cases is that people think, well, oh, they got, you know, they did, they did all, they got their statistical results and they did some crazy heuristic thing and then they published this and it's such bullshit, they're such bullshitters. But they're not actually looking back into the model. There are so many human assumptions in your model in the first place. The mere fact that you would consider polynomials in some situation is from some like deep thing in your past. Why does everyone model their errors as Gaussian? Because we have human generated 
math results about Gaussians. I mean, sometimes processes really are Gaussian, but in most applications of Gaussian errors, we're using them because we can. So there's a huge amount of like human judgment, background, prejudice, and all those things going into the assumptions of the model. So if you just get numbers out and you figure you could just obey those numbers, you're forgetting about the fact that, in fact, this is the end point of a huge amount of subjective judgment. And there's no reason to end your subjective judgment when you first write down this function, and then after that, everything's subjective. So just yeah. a quick question. If you use chi square for degree of freedom, on yes. all number examples, which model is I have no idea. Huh. I would never do such a horror. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but you but can I would see, I would see an example of how yeah. how that since I've used that in every paper. Yeah. 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 And you yeah. always yeah. have been wrong. Yeah. But, but you've been yeah. in the cool cat days. No, no, I'm also confused. No, no. I know, but 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 it is Andy Gould. Let's. Can I take a few seconds to answer the Andy Gould thing? Yeah. Wants to read, yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel free to just roll because I'm just going to say if you. I want oh, this before, brings. I'm sorry. Before people leave, do make sure to clean up. <laughs> yeah, can somebody uh, can somebody scrub the floor here? <laughs> no, um, just simple things. And if you have a dishwasher, you can use the dishwasher. You can put things in the dishwasher too. Okay. So there was this crazy Andy Gould paper about precision versus accuracy on the archive. If you didn't read it. I don't know whether I recommend you should read it or not. It's a little crazy. Uh, however, it does make one good point. It makes one good point and then a whole bunch of really bad points. But the good point it makes is that, that chi-squared over the number of degrees of freedom, what is the number of degrees of freedom? I never even remember. Chi-squared over the number of data points minus the number of parameters is something people often use. Now, first of all, the theorem from statistics, the theorems from statistics are not about that quantity. The theorems from statistics are that chi squared, if your model is a good fit, which I can talk for hours, as you can tell, about that. But if your model is a good fit, then chi squared should be something like n minus k plus or minus the square root of n minus k. And maybe there's a 2 here. It's very 2. Anyway, there's some number here, uh, which I don't remember. Okay, that's the result. Note the result is not about chi-squared per degree of freedom. It's about chi-squared. Now, you can transform this result by dividing by n minus k, and you get 1 plus or minus the square root q of the square root of 1 over n minus k. But that doesn't <laughs> increase the uh, understanding of it, dividing chi-squared by something is like taking your likelihood to a weird power. This is a statement about the likelihood. It's about how good the likelihood should be. And of course, this has many assumptions. By the way, this has the same assumptions as these. AIC, BIC, and this all have the same assumptions. They assume the model is linear in parameters, and the errors are Gaussian, and they're known. Right? It's those assumptions, and those are also the assumptions that make this true. Now, what is this used for? This is not used for parameter estimation. This is used for assessing whether your model is okay. So first of all, only people who obey these rules should use it, and very few models obey these rules. Certainly cosmology does not obey those rules. Um, second thing is, this thing is, uh, is a a, a, is a statement is does the is the model ruled out by the data and if you're a strict frequentist if you're a strict frequentist and you obey this rule you must preserve the model and if you're a strict frequentist and you don't obey this rule you must reject the model see what I'm saying that means you can't use this to decide between models you have to keep all of the models that obey this and you must throw away all of the models that don't obey it. And by the way, that throws away lambda CDM with the WMAP data. Because WMAP data doesn't obey it. Because what, what, what the Bayesians like to say is this is, just a, this is just a measure of the size of your data. 
Because once your data get large enough, you always reject the model. Because the model always has assumptions in it which are wrong. Once you have enough data, you always end up rejecting it according to this criteria. However, if you're a strict frequentist, you must keep all models that obey this, and you must throw away all models that don't obey this. And you're not allowed to make things obey this by changing the error bars, which is, of course, what uh, Google does in that paper. And the reason you're not allowed to do that is because it strongly violates the linearity condition and then it, it validates the criteria. So this really is just that. So oh, I meant, was going to say accuracy. So this is a statement about accuracy. <coughs> this is a statement about precision. This is saying, which model is more precise? This model is saying, is the model accurate? This produces only, uh, well, this does not produce comparative information, essentially. In fact, in general, if you're a frequentist, you can't really compare models. You're just asking what models are consistent with the data and what models are not consistent with the data. And they're in bags. So if you talk to Kyle Cranmer, is very good, actually, at describing the strict frequentist philosophy. And the strict frequentist philosophy, you just have a bag of models which remain acceptable given the data you've seen. And this is one of the ways you check whether it remains acceptable, if you obey these. If you mess with your error bars, though, holy shit, that is so not right that this all goes to hell. So it really is not usable in that 